We're here today with Ray Kurzweil, one of the world's leading inventors, thinkers, and futurists, uh, the recipient of countless honorary doctorates, awards from three U.S. presidents, recipient of the Medal of Technology Award in 1999, the Lemelson MIT Prize in 2001, co-founder of the Singularity University, and also the author of a number of books, including The Age of Intelligent Machines, The 10% Solution for a Healthy Life, The Age of Spiritual Machines, The Singularity is Near, and he's also the co-author of several others, including Fantastic Voyage, Live Long Enough to Live Forever, and Transcend, Nine Steps to Living Well Forever, both co-authored with Terry Grossman. But the reason we're here today is to talk about music, and in particular, the past, the present, and the future of music making. So, Ray, I'd like to go in a time machine back, if we may, to around 1970 when you graduated from MIT. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about your life and how it was influenced by music up to that point, your, your childhood and your parents and how your life was influenced by music. Yeah, well, 1970 actually was a pivotal year because my father died then, and he was uh, probably the biggest influence in my life in terms of music. He was a great musician and was quite noted in his day uh, he's conductor of the Bell Symphony, which was the symphony orchestra of the Bell Telephone System, appeared on TV a lot, performed in Carnegie Hall, which was the music venue in New York before Lincoln Center was built. Uh, I mean, I used to get taken to concerts with him as a child, and it had a deep influence on me. And when I was a little older, we had conversations about the philosophy of music, the connection of music to thinking, music to math, uh, music to psychology, uh, music to computers. He said, you know, someday you're going to connect music making to computers. I did have one project uh, which he did uh, participate in and was able to see, which was when I was in high school, I uh, programmed a computer to analyze melodies from particular composers. That was actually my first national recognition. I got to meet President Johnson. I was one of the um, and he was able to participate in that. But he said, someday you're going to combine computers with the actual sounds, uh, because th the actual sounds, the complexity of it, the physics of sound, uh, can be analyzed by computer and recreated. And so that was the first, actual indication of the idea of Kurzweil music uh, in the late 60s. Uh, I met Stevie Wonder uh, in 1976 as a result of the Kurzweil reading machine. Uh, we unveiled it January 13, 1976. Uh, it appeared on uh, the, the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. It's probably before your time, but he had a signature sign-off. He, he would say in his sonorous voice, and that's the way it was, and he would say the date. So for the first time, he didn't read that himself. He had the reading machine read, and that's the way it was, January 13, 1976. I was invited to go on the Today Show the next day, so I demonstrated that the reading machine on the Today Show, and Stevie Wonder caught that, called my office. The receptionist didn't really believe it was a legendary musician calling. He said, well, I'm in Boston, I'd like to stop over. And she didn't believe that this was real, but he did stop over. We gave him our first production model. June 83, we brought to the Chicago NAMM show a prototype of the Criswell 250. And Stevie Wonder approved, not only of the sound, but also the feel. It was a completely different technology, but we had a mechanical action that really felt like the complex action of a real piano. So, so, the, so when you developed the K250, what were some of the technology trends that, you know, you're talking about electronic music, what was kind of going on at that time, and what did you see that could make this possible? There were a few things. Uh, Moog in the late 60s had popularized the Moog synthesizer, which was analog, not digital. And it didn't pretend to recreate a piano, or it created a whole new class of sounds. But it was very exciting, and the album switched on Bach really brought it to a mass audience. And that became a real rave. Suddenly, musicians had a much larger palette of sounds. Uh, then there was the world of sampling. Uh, mostly, that was pretty expensive. There was a Fairlight, which cost something like $30,000. But sampling, uh, you'd think, okay, that could capture a piano sound because it would just record the piano sound. But unfortunately, a piano doesn't just make one sound. Even one key doesn't make one sound. If you hit it harder, it's not just louder. It's a whole different time-varying 
uh, waveform. The high frequency partials attack more quickly and die more quickly. In some ways, the human auditory system is amazing. We can detect very slight changes in frequency and the slightest little difference we can pick up. In other ways, we're easily fooled. You have to, these are called psychoacoustic effects, understanding how the human auditory system perceives musical sound. You need to know that to know where you can get away with differences and where, where you need to be precise. So we studied that and we came up with an instrument that to the human ear sounded realistic. Not just you played one sound, but you actually played it with, you know, with the variation in loudness uh, and amplitude that, you, that the piano forte, which is the full name of the instrument, provides. Uh, really sounded realistic. 